Welcome to the latest episode in this series of Close Readings, a series we have called The Long and Short, because in it we are looking at a number of modern long poems and short stories written in English. Modern meaning, in this case, late 19th and 20th century. And as always, our conversation will be informed by the rich collection of essays, reviews and other pieces that make up the back archive of the London Review of Books. My name is Seamus Perry and I teach English literature at Balliol College in Oxford and I'm talking to Mark Ford, poet, critic and professor of English at University College London. So Mark, with this episode we move from the 19th century, from the people we've talked about before, Tennyson, Whitman, James, to our first 20th century voice, the great New Zealand writer Catherine Mansfield on the occasion of the centenary of her death. And I suppose one thing we might begin by discussing is uh, the ways in which uh, her short stories are significantly different from the short stories that we looked at by James. Yes, uh, James's stories, though in, in many ways dramatising crises in consciousness or the relationship between the uh, author and uh, the reader, still very much belong to the 19th century in that they have a plot and they present the kind of convolutions of consciousness, in James's case, to, to an extraordinary Baroque extent. Uh, whereas the 20th century short story, w what one thinks of is economy and uh, the elliptical and stories that a slice of life, stories that n are not part of some ongoing narrative. And I think the great influence on 20th century short stories or short stories from the first part of the 20th century were Flaubert and Chekhov. And particularly in the case of Mansfield, one can see the influence of Chekhov, who was being translated um, only at the start of the 20th century or late 19th century into English. And his work had an enormous effect on a, a variety of writers. And Mansfield Circle were particularly um, interested in Chekhov's work. So Chekhov was the sort of great discovery in some ways of the writers who specialised in the short story. And Mansfield is like Chekhov, only write stories. I mean, she did hope to write a novel, or there's a sense in which the material uh, published um, as the short story Prelude was going to be developed into a longer piece. But her, she died when she was only 34. Uh, the, the work that she's left us is, is all short stories. And, but she was also committed to the, to the genre of the short story and the influences of the writers that she knew at the time, particularly D.H. Lawrence, but also James Joyce's Dubliners and so on. You can see the ways in which she was exploring the ways in which the 20th century short story had evolved out of its um, sources, in particular in, in Flaubert and Chekhov. Yes, and I'm sure one of the things we'll come on to talk about is the way that many of her short stories revolve around things that in some ways don't quite happen or there are non-events in, in, in various ways. And that, that's very characteristic, isn't it, of the, of the modernist short story in particular. And perhaps one of the things that draws it close to what poetry is doing also within the modernist period, I mean, modernist poetry is very rarely dominated by plot, for example. Um, and there are um, great poets, aren't there, of the early part of the 20th century, like Edward Thomas, for example, who write little poems. Um, Adlestrop would be a famous example. Little poems about um, uh, episodes in which absolutely nothing of any consequence occurs. Yes, I suppose you could say it's the vignette, <laughs> which becomes a kind of dominant... A prism for both the poets and the short story writers of the period. I'm thinking of Ezra Pound in The Station of the Metro, mm. the apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bough, that is all you get. So the economy, that I mean, and Wolf talks about this, one of the things all the 20th century writers were looking to do was to escape the over-furnished rooms, as she calls them, of 19th century fiction. And that involves cutting things out. <laughs> Uh, Pound wrote that a much longer poem and then cut it down to just those two lines. And I think that um, Mansfield's stories also have, she talked about some of them as having a kind of poetic rhythm to them. Uh, she was talking about Miss Brill and how there's a rhythm to it and she could read it over and over and everything was right. So the kinds of economy, concision and um, a attempt to capture the fragmentary nature of early 20th century life, that things Plots, our narratives are not making sense anymore. And obviously the most extreme examples of uh, work of art that 
dramatises that would be The Wasteland. Uh, and she did meet Elliot um, at Otterline Morell's, um, and Elliot wrote a, a little bit about her. So she did move in those kind of Bloomsbury circles, which were in which Elliot moved and, of course, Wolf uh, moved. And Wolf, you know, famously wrote of Mansfield, I was jealous of her writing, the only writing I've ever been jealous of. Mm. Um, and I think Mansfield and, and Wolf, because they spent a, quite a bit of time together, are a really interesting pair to put against each other. Yes, well, maybe we'll come back to, um, to, to Wolf um, in a little bit when we look at some of her more um, maybe Wolfian short stories. Um, that that um, uh, the thing you said about uh, w- wanting to to leave the cluttered, large uh, rooms of of Victorian literature, um, I think that's a very good thing for us to k- keep in our minds as we continue this discussion, isn't it? It picks up on a thing that Lorna Sage says in her LRB piece, which I I liked a lot, where she said that one of Mansfield's great achievements was uh, to pull off what Sage calls the illusionist feat of storing infinite riches in a little room. And I think that summarises very brilliantly not just what Mansfield is up to, but perhaps what the modernist short story is up to more generally. It's, It's a genre, isn't it, which is full of kind of implication and things which are on the very, as it were, edge of our perception, but just haven't been written about in this particular text. Yes, and I think the great pleasures of Mansfield's um, short stories are their subtleties, that they are particularly indirect. And in that, she's interesting to contrast with Joyce on the one hand and Lawrence on the other. Lawrence can be pretty blunt (laughs) in his short stories and can make us know what he's up to, whereas Joyce developed... um, much more kind of um, indirect ways of exploring conditions which are in some ways similar to the sorts of condition that Mansfield explores, things like paralysis or being um, somehow coping with a a disruption or a crisis or indeed presenting social occasions like Joyce's The Dead, one might compare with The Garden Party, Mm -hmm. for instance. So certainly the infinite riches in a little room. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's riffing on John Donne, isn't it? Um, who was, of course, very influential on, on the way that Eliot's poetry developed. And I think that kind of compactness um, is also something one finds in these short stories. Well, so we should say something about her, her life, shouldn't we? She's, she's born in 1888 in Wellington in New Zealand. But at still quite an early age, 1903, she's in London. She's enrolled at Queen's College in Harley Street. And after three years there, she returns to New Zealand. Her family is uh, is the sort of family that my mother would have called well-to-do. Her father's a very successful banker. And thanks to his money, uh, she is allowed to return to London in 1908 on an allowance, um, and as far as one can tell, the point of her returning to London is to fine-tune herself as as a writer. She has a pretty disastrous marriage and a rather tangled and, and difficult emotional life in, in various ways. And then in 1911, she starts to publish, uh, and then she meets the person who I suppose is the most Im- important partner, I guess, in her life, who's a man called John Middleton Murray. Um, Can you tell us something about this extraordinary person? (laughs) Well, um, Middleton Murray was someone who who held together uh, a lot of kind of Bloomsbury or literary types because they all disliked him so much. And it's hard to read about Middleton Murray or read his stuff without wondering what Mansfield saw in him, to be honest. I suppose we should... Uh, it's worth remembering that she's coming from, though Wellington is an important place in New Zealand, there's a, certainly a sense in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in which the cultural action is not happening in Auckland or Wellington and that, uh, like Joyce in Dublin, Mansfield is a writer who comes from a provincial, as she, as it would have been seen, was seen by her, part of the empire um, and uh, comes to London to make her name. And I think that that sense of moving from somewhere which was, uh, in many ways, the Wellington society and culture was in some ways mimetic of what was understood of life in the home, as they used to call British culture. But coming to London was to go to the centre of the universe at that point. And in the 20th century, I mean, any number of writers, you know, Conrad um, would be another example of people who end up coming to England because England is the centre of empire and it's where the cultural action is. So Mansfield, to some extent, was rejecting her family when she sets off for London and none of her siblings, she had 
I think, four sisters and a brother. Uh, well, the, the brother dies in the First World War, but the sister siblings all remain in New Zealand. But I think, I mean, well-to-do is, is they were richer than well-to-do. They were really quite wealthy. Um, but she was you know, born Kathleen Mansfield Beauchamp. Uh, and then changed her name to Catherine Mansfield. And she, she invented lots of nicknames for herself. Um, and she was always presenting herself, signing her letters Wig or Tig or some other, some other nickname. So there's a sense in which she was exploring her identity. And I think coming from New Zealand to London gave her the sense that her identity was fluid and that she could improvise an identity or invent a new identity for herself. And I think that worked kind of sexually as well. There's quite a bit of discussion in the LRB pieces of to what extent the lesbianism was an issue for Mansfield, what exactly was her relationship with this person that she met at that school called Ida Barry. And Ida Barry, who was nicknamed by... by she would give other people nicknames as well, uh, Leslie Moore or L.M., was in a way sometimes described as Mansfield's wife. Um, She wasn't her wife, um, but she looked after Mansfield in in a way which is sort of incomprehensible (laughs) to some of us, but uh, in almost slavishly hero-worshipped Mansfield. Thanks for listening to this extract from The Long and Short, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episodes and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.